So the kidneys funk, um, filter the blood. So the kidneys obviously have a huge blood supply. The kidneys receive um, between 20 and 25% of the total cardiac output. That's a lot. So as your heart is pumping blood out to your body, about a quarter of the blood every minute goes to the kidneys. That's a ton of blood. Okay, very, very, very important. Blood flow to the kidneys is highly important. That's about 1,200 milliliters of blood each minute. And we said that the blood goes in to the kidney via the renal artery. And then remember, it exits via the renal vein right here at the hilum. We'll talk a lot about kind of the way that blood flows through the kidney. Because again, this is the whole point. The kidneys go through the blood. So you need to know where the blood's flowing and how it actually gets into the nephrons and then how it gets out of the kidneys. Here we see the flow of blood. All of this and all of this is really just review from lab um, and should be pretty familiar. I really want to kind of focus on this part down here because this is all of the functional part. Um, everything that's happening as we go into the um, nephron, as we leave the nephron, and then in the paratubular capillaries. That's where the physiology is happening. Um, we already should be familiar with the fact that blood comes in via the renal artery. Then we get to these segmental arteries that branch off and go to the different segments of the kidney. The interlobar arteries come in between each of the pyramids. The arcuate arteries arc around the outside of the pyramid. And then the interlobular arteries radiate out through the cortex. I'll review. From the interlobular artery, remember we're going into the afferent glomerular arterial. The afferent glomerular arterial, remember, is what's bringing blood into the actual glomerulus. And that's where blood is filtered. So this is where all the action's happening, right? That's the whole point of all of this, is to get the blood here to this glomerulus, which is part of the nephron. That's where the blood is actually filtered, and then blood leaves the glomerulus via the efferent glomerular arterial. Right, so remember, A comes before P. It goes in via the afferent, it leaves via the efferent. The efferent glomerular arterial is going to deliver blood to a set of capillaries called the paratubular capillaries. These are important because this is where all of the reabsorption back into the blood is going to occur. Remember, we said some stuff gets filtered out that we want to keep, right? That stuff that gets filtered out that we want to keep has to come back into the bloodstream at some point. This is where it enters back into the bloodstream through these paratubular capillaries. Then we collect into a bunch of venules and then we just make our way out pretty much the exact same way we went in. We have interlobular veins out here, arcuate veins that arc around, interlobar veins that go between the pyramids. Um, again, I kind of have this long line here because your, um, your book says that we're going straight to renal veins. Surgical texts, like very, very detailed texts, include segmental veins as well there. Okay, but I won't include this on anything. Okay. So we followed this, the, this path of blood, right? Or we followed the blood flow to get out to the cortex in order to bring the blood to the nephron. And we said that the nephron was the actual unit that does all of the filtering, right? This is the thing that actually filters the blood and produces the urine. When we look at a nephron, we can break it up really kind of broadly into a renal corpuscle and a renal tubule. The renal corpuscle is the big round head portion of the snake. And then the renal tubule is this long, thin body of the snake. When we look at the renal corpus on the renal tubule, we can then break each of those up into distinct kind of parts and distinct segments. The renal tubule, this long, thin passageway, um, starts here at the renal corpuscle, 
Okay, so it starts right by the head and it comes, it goes, it twists all around and ultimately we see that it ends at a collecting belt. Looking at the actual tubule itself, we split it up into three large regions. The first region that we see is the proximal convoluted tubule. <sighs> proximal, remember like proximal distal, right? Proximal was close to the site of attachment. Distal is distant from the site of attachment. So when you look at the tubule, it attaches to the renal corpuscle right here. So this would be more proximal. If you follow along the tube, way over here would be more distal. So this is the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal because it's close, convoluted because it's super twisted. This is like a really simple version. It's a highly twisted tube, right? And that's convoluted. And you say, that is a convoluted story, right? It's, it's all twisted back and forth, doesn't really make sense. It's not necessarily linear. After the proximal convoluted tubule, we get to the loop of Henle, or that's also called the nephron loop. Okay, this is this sharp hairpin loop right here. Goes straight down, curves, comes straight back up. And then finally, the distal convoluted tubule. Again, that's this last section here. And again, I drew it simple. It's actually really convoluted. Okay, but distal because it's more distant from the corpuscle convoluted because it's twisted. So we have the PCT, the loop of Henle, and then the DCT. That flows into the collecting duct, which remember goes down the pyramid through the papillary duct into the minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, and out. So this head portion, of the nephron, we said is called the renal corpuscle. And just like the tubule had multiple distinct parts, the renal corpuscle has multiple distinct parts as well. I'll just start here. When we look at this renal corpuscle or this big kind of head region, we can break it up into this outer capsule, okay, so this nice strong capsule that forms the outer wall, and then something called the glomerulus on the inside. The glomerulus, again, is, it's on the inside here of the capsule, and what the glomerulus is, I can't draw it, but inside this capsule, and what the glomerulus is, is it's literally a ball of tons and tons of interconnected capillaries. So we bring blood in and then we've got all these capillaries, like a capillary bed, right? The way a capillary bed kind of goes on all directions and the capillaries are all interconnected. It's like a little mini capillary bed in here. And then the blood eventually leaves. So when we look at all of these capillaries that make up the glomerulus, Something that's important is that the capillaries are fenestrated. They're not normal continuous capillaries. They are fenestrated, which remember means that they contain pores. When we talked about fenestrated capillaries with pores, what kind of things fit through those pores? Ions, right, and water go really easy because they've got those large pores. So small things like ions and water go super easy through them. Um, what, what kind of nutrients do you think? Glucose. Glucose. Okay. Fatty acids and amino acids. Okay, so all of our small nutrients, ions, water, very easily fit through the pores in these capillaries. When we look at this glomerulus, we already talked a little bit about these arterioles, but blood goes into the glomerulus via the afferent arteriole. So A goes in and blood leaves via the etheric arteriole. 
Again, A before E. Okay, so the afferent arterial brings blood into these, the glomerulus, the fenestrated capillaries. Blood leaves via the efferent arterial. Something that's very important about these arterioles is that the efferent arterial is smaller. Okay, so the afferent, the vessel going in, is bigger than the vessel leaving. So the efferent is smaller. This provides resistance that drives the filtration of blood. We bring a bunch of blood in, and then when the blood tries to leave, there's a ton of resistance. There's an itty bitty little vessel, so all of that blood can't leave at once. That creates this back pressure, and what that pressure does is it drives the filtration of blood. It pushes the blood or fluid out of the capillaries and into this capsular space. Does that make sense? Okay, remember constriction creates resistance, creates pressure. Things go from high pressure to low pressure. So the, the, uh, the fluid, the solutes, the nutrients, everything goes out of the blood into that capsular space. When we look at the capsule itself, the glomerular capsule that goes around the outside here, we call that Bowman's capsule. And we see that we have a membrane that lines the capsule and the glomerulus, a double layer membrane, just like we see in all of our cavities, because this is kind of like an organ inside a cavity, right? So with our organs and cavities, how we had a parietal layer and a visceral layer lining them, we have the same sort of setup here. We have a parietal layer on the outside lining the capsule, and then we have a visceral layer lining the actual glomerulus. So the outer layer is just a simple squamous epithelium, right? So this parietal epithelium just lines the capsule like this, and then it curves around, and we have a visceral epithelium that lines the actual capillaries. This visceral epithelium that lines the capillaries is made of these special cells called podocytes. And you guys remember we mentioned those in lab, right? When we looked at the actual glomerulus, we saw these little yellow cells that were wrapped all around it. And those yellow cells we said were called podocytes. We call them podocytes, so all of the cells that make up this visceral epithelium, all of the cells that line these capillaries, we call podocytes. We call them podocytes because they have pedicels. Pedi means what? When you get a pedicure, what do you get? <laughs> foot, right? Pedi is like feet, foot. So when we look at these, um, these podocytes, they have pedicels. They have these feet or these processes that reach out and wrap around the capillaries. So they form almost a complete covering around the capillaries almost okay so they wrap around they almost completely cover the, the capillaries but they leave these tiny little slits between the pedicels so there are itty bitty little gaps between their processes and those gaps we call filtration slits um now this is important because remember the whole point here is that we've got blood flowing through these glomerular capillaries and we're gonna filter stuff out of the blood and into all of the space, right? That capsular space. We're filtering stuff out of the blood to make urine. Now we said that these capillaries are what kind of capillaries? Fenestrated. Fenestrated. So anything that leaves the blood and goes into this capsular space has to fit through their fenestrations, right? It's gotta fit through the pores. Now, the visceral epithelium, these podocytes, create another barrier. Okay, now anything that leaves the blood not only has to go through the fenestrated capillaries or through the pores, it also has to be able to squeeze through these filtration slits. If it's too big to fit through these narrow little openings between the cells, it will not leave the bloodstream. So it's just another barrier in that filter 
um, to kind of stop things from leaving the bloodstream and entering into that capsular space. Yes. Yep, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we go. Ultimately, we don't want to lose all those um, well, the nutrients are still small enough to fit through. We deal with those later. Okay. Um, but this will stop things like blood cells, platelets. Platelets are really small. Um, we don't want to lose platelets. So all of plasma proteins will all remain in the bloodstream. So here we see, remember, the whole point is we're talking about a nephron. The nephron has the renal corpuscle, this big head region. And then it has the renal tubule, right? This long, thin tube region. That ends up leading into the collecting duct, right? And ultimately the urine leads um, via the papillary duct and into the minor calyx. Now we're focusing on the renal corpuscle or the head region, right? So that's what we see blown up right here is this large um, renal corpuscle. We have the capsule, right, Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule around the outside. And then what are all these capillaries called on the inside? What do we refer to this structure as? The glomerulus. We have a blood vessel bringing blood into the glomerulus. Which one is that? Good. And we have a blood vessel leaving. What do we call that? Which one's smaller? Why? Pressure, beautiful. So the afferent's bigger, we bring a bunch of blood in. The efferent's smaller, so it's hard for that blood to leave and it creates this backlog that increases pressure. The pressure drives filtration, right? It pushes stuff out of the blood and into this capsular space. Remember, we've got a couple different membranes present here. This parietal membrane is just the simple squamous membrane that forms the outer wall and then we curve in and on top of the glomerulus we have a visceral membrane and we said that that's made up of all these cells called podocytes. They have a bunch of processes or little feet that wrap around the glomerular capillaries and they leave tiny little gaps between them. Okay, those little gaps we call filtration splits. So anything that makes its way out of the blood and into this capsular space has to fit through the pores in the capillaries. What kind of capillaries? Fenestrated. Fenestrated, good. So it's gotta fit through the pores in the capillaries and it's gotta fit through these filtration slits in order to be filtered out into this capsular space. Eventually, remember that filtrate is gonna make its way over here into the tubule. So it'll go to the proximal convoluted tubule, then the loop of Henle, and then it'll go through the distal convoluted tubule, and then again into the collecting ducts. And as it flows through that tubule, we'll perfect the fluid. Because remember, we're just filtering at based on what? Size. Size, right? Not necessity, not usefulness, nothing, just size. So we're gonna rely on the tubule to make sure we're getting rid of what we want to and we're keeping what we want to. We've mentioned this quite a bit. Um, but the glomerular capillaries are fenestrated, meaning they have pores in their lining or in their endothelium. And anything that goes across the filtration membrane or goes out of the blood and into the capsule has to go through this fenestrated endothelium. It has to go through the filtration slits. And then the dense layer just refers to the connection between the two. It's acellular. It's not a cell. It's just um, like the basal lamina or the little acellular connection. Um, but again, we've got pores and then even smaller filtration slits. If it can fit through both of those layers, it makes its way out and into the capsular space. So our whole second lecture really focuses on GFR or glomerular filtration. But in general, um, what we see is that blood pressure is going to force things out of the blood and into the capsular space. And we just mentioned things get filtered out um, of the blood based on what? Size. Based on size. So small things make it through, large things don't. Now this is helpful because things we want to get rid of get filtered out. So metabolic wastes, 
hey, urea, creatinine, uric acid, that sort of stuff goes out in the urine. Um, extra ions get filtered out, um, so that's helpful. However, some stuff we don't want to lose also gets filtered out. Okay, so we said glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, vitamins, all of these useful things that we want to retain are small. So they also get filtered out into that fluid. Um, water just follows the stuff, right? So the water also gets pushed out into the capsular space. Um, again, we'll rely on the tubule to reabsorb these useful things. Larger solutes are not able to make their way out. Um, so if we start to link together amino acids and get larger polypeptides, they will not make their way out into the capsular space. Um, or some of our large protein-based hormones will not make their way out into the capsular space. Plasma proteins, blood cells, so white blood cells, red blood cells, should not be making their way out of the bloodstream, and then platelets as well. Okay, so these things we should not be seeing in the urine. Protein should not be in the urine. Red blood cells should not be in the urine. White blood cells should not be in the urine. If we see these things in the urine, that indicates something going on. Maybe there's an infection and then the white blood cells are migrating. Um, maybe there's kidney damage and we start to see plasma proteins or really, really high blood pressure, we start to see plasma proteins. But these things should not be present in the urine. So after filtration in the renal corpuscle, the fluid, which we now call filtrate, right? We had blood in the glomerulus. Now when we exit the glomerulus and go out into the capsule, the fluid is called filtrate. The filtrate is gonna leave the corpuscle and enter the renal tubule, right? It enters into what part of the renal tubule first? The proximal convoluted tubule, then the loop of Henle or nephron loop, and then what? the distal convoluted tubule. As the filtrate, um, which is then gonna become tubular fluid, goes through the renal tubule, we essentially just perfect it, right? We just filtered based on size. There was no rationale, it was just size. So now as we go through that long tubule, we have to perfect the fluid and make sure that at the end, we actually have urine, a waste product, instead of something useful that we actually want to keep. So throughout the tubule, we reabsorb a lot, okay? We reabsorb, should be 100% of nutrients. Okay, so all the glucose, all the fatty acids, all the amino acids should be normally under most conditions reabsorbed back into the body. We also reabsorb a lot of ions, okay? The vast majority of ions that get filtered out, we reabsorb back into the body. We reabsorb almost all the water, Okay, so more than 90% of the water that gets filtered out, we reabsorb as we go through the tubule. And then we also secrete some things. Remember, secretion is the opposite, or actually this excrete would be more accurate. We excrete wastes and excess ions into the fluid. Okay, sometimes we have a ton of, say, calcium um, that's built up in the bloodstream and we need to get rid of more of it than gets filtered out. In that case, we can actively pump it into the tubule so that it makes its way out in the urine. Okay, same thing with wastes. We can actively pump wastes into the tubule. Okay, but in these cases, we're reabsorbing things back into the blood. When we excrete things, we're putting extra stuff from the blood into the tubular fluid okay, to get rid of it in the urine. happens in the DCT, we're going to talk through it, um, but there is some that happens in the collecting duct. By the time you get to the papillary duct, it's fine. Nothing enters or leaves. There's a little bit more that happens in the collecting duct, but we'll talk through all of it um, probably next lecture. All right, so we said as we go through the renal tubule, we first go to the proximal convoluted tubule, which is the initial segment up in the cortex. Okay. Um, then we go to the loop of Henle, 
And at the end, we have the distal convoluted tubule, which is the final segment in the cortex. The loop of Henry or Henley or nephron loop, we said is that tight kind of hairpin turn that looks like this. It dips down towards the medulla and then comes back up towards the cortex again. Um, as we travel along the tubule, um, all of them, the PCT, the loop of Henley, and then the DCT, we see that the tubular fluid gradually changes in composition. And the changes that occur to the fluid are very, very different in each of the segments. Okay, so again, we'll talk through this, it's gonna be next lecture, um, but we'll see that in the PCT, the, the transporters that we have and what we're reabsorbing <coughs> is very different than what we see in the descending limb of the loop of Henley. That's very different than what we see in the ascending limb. That's very different than what we see in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, so we have very, very distinct processes happening in each part um, of the nephron. Again, we'll talk through it. We're just gonna kind of finish following the flow of this fluid first. So we brought blood into the kidney. We brought the blood out to the cortex and the blood went from the upbearing arterial to the glomerulus. And in the glomerulus, we filtered stuff out of the blood into the capsule, right? From the capsule, um, the fluid then went into the tubule. It went through the proximal convoluted tubules, the loop of Henle, and then the distal convoluted tubule. After that, the nephrons empty into the collecting system. And the collecting system is just that. It collects urine, essentially. It's a series of tubes and funnels um, and ducts that are gonna collect all of the urine from the nephrons and then ultimately bring it down to the hilum where it can exit the kidney. So initially we have collecting ducts. A collecting duct will receive urine um, or fluid from numerous different nephrons. Okay, so the duct will have nephrons that just empty into it like this. And tons of nephrons will be pushing their, their filtrate um, into this collecting duct. The collecting duct begins towards like out at the base of the pyramid, so out by the cortex, and then it brings the fluid down toward through the medulla, through the pyramid, and towards the point or papilla. As the collecting duct goes through the, the papilla or the renal papilla, it becomes the papillary duct. And remember we said that papillary duct enters into this nice little cup-shaped funnel that we called a minor calyx. We just mentioned that we have some variable um, adjustment of the fluid that can occur in the collecting duct, but by the time we get down to the papillary duct, that's it. The papillary duct is impenetrable. We don't absorb or secrete anything, and that's the final fluid, right? That's it. Um, we can adjust a little in the collecting duct, but once we're in the papillary duct, it's urine. Um, it's the way it's going to be for the body. 